Hey everybody, welcome back to Retro Tech. Today, I wanted to do a follow-up on a story that I covered actually about one year ago exactly from today, and uh, I hope everybody's doing well, and I thought maybe I'd bring you a new story you're guaranteed not to read or see about probably anywhere else in the mainstream media, and that is an article here from The Register, which is just a tech IT uh, site, I guess, so... The reason I bring this up is it's a follow-up to this story where um, there's a CRT monitor class action lawsuit from 13 years ago now, and uh, there's an update to it. So I thought I'd bring, this article was sent to me yesterday, and I read through it, and I read through the um, interesting stuff here. So I'm just going to go through some of the highlights on here because it's quite interesting on uh, what's actually going on. So first off, uh, 13 years ago... There were first court papers were submitted. So this is 13 years ago. They submitted the initial uh, filings. And since then, there's been 5,733 additional filings in the case. So that means that the attorneys have been really busy with this one. Uh, this is about CRTs that were made between 1990 and sold between 1995 to 2007, which is a pretty long period. Uh, time period and the life cycle of the CRT. This is actually right about the time when the patent ran out on Sony's Trinitron. And then uh, these companies, everybody except Sony almost, pretty much, uh, that didn't make the Trinitron tube had to get together and they decided to do an antitrust uh, price setting where they all raised their prices to make sure that they were making enough money uh, as well as competing still with Sony. So that was the original case, but again, these are new. Uh, the, this whole thing centers around allegations that the group of CRT manufacturers again got together. Uh, there's an original defendants now. Look, don't get excited because they've already closed off the list of people that can file or sign up to get on this defendants list, or not the defendants list. I'm sorry, the uh, people who are in the class action actually get a payout. But uh, again, the this was filed originally in 2007. The brands that were alleged to be part of this scheme were Hitachi, Toshiba, Philips, Samsung, and Matsushita, as well as, um, well, there was a small group of attorneys as well as a large group of plaintiffs who signed up to be part of these classes. And pretty much, uh, fast forward, there was a settlement. It was $563 million paid out uh, to a fund, pretty much. And that was finally supposed to be done in 2015, but of course, after they decided the amount of money, fast forward five years to the present, and the lawyers are still in Oakland, California, filing more <laughs> paperwork and filings to argue over who gets what's left of this now $513 million settlement, which I'm not, I mean, somebody did take it notes in this uh latest filing that there was an expense of $29 million in it and then maybe some attorney's fees they got paid no matter what. So again, the court has not made and the judge in this case has not made a decision regarding this. So the law stu so still the lawyers are going at it and uh, they will make out well though. So that's what they're all fighting over. This will continue to drag on until the final court and uh, John Ty Tiger or whoever else is the judge in this finally makes a final decision and, and then it exhausts all the appeals. So this is really what happens in these lawsuits. I mean, these get drawn out incredibly long. This is how normally every class action suit happens. So basically, if you bought a brand new CRT monitor from 1995 to 2007, and it was one of the brands I just mentioned, they were price gouging by setting a price that was way higher for their product and then flatlining that, like trying to make an even playing field with Sony saying, we're setting our price here, and then everybody else in the industry is going to set our price within that parameter uh, to compete against Sony. If you want to go get a Sony, you have to deal with their pricing. The rest of us are going to be on one pricing pretty much so that they didn't compete with each other. They were just trying to compete with Sony for the most part. So this latest filing comes from this Scarpula, who is Francis Scarpula, an attorney for one of these subclasses, which is the class action, uh, the people that are part of one of the subclasses who signed up, goodness, between 2007 and I think 2015-ish, 
They signed up for that eight-year period to be part of the class action. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, so basically, if you run through this whole objection, I did read the whole thing. It's so much legalese. It's ridiculous. But there are still a bunch of objections from this attorney's group. Uh, and it's, it's still deeply rooted in things like problems with how the class was uh, class members were separated and they were treated inequitably, basically saying they weren't valued high enough. Uh, the class cannot be certified because, again, and that's three different objections here for basically the members and the way the members have been uh, che or classified or even legitimized. Some of them were saying they were not legitimate. Uh, multiple class representatives do not have standing. Again, that's the same kind of deal. Here's that $29 million removed from the sediment as attributable to claims from the ORS and NRS. So these two law firms, uh, maybe we're getting money, which is from the complaint comes from them, which is interesting. So I don't know whether that means they claim that somebody else was getting attorney fees or whatever. But then, uh, and then finally, class members was legally defective, the notice. So again, they want to go ahead and send a new legal notice to every class member, which I'm sure is hundreds of thousands of people probably. The attorney fees request is excessive. So then you got, you know, more legalese on what they define as excessive. There's not really an example or it doesn't say the exact amount of money that the attorneys were trying to get. But at the long, the end of the day, the only people that make out rich on these deals is the attorneys because once it gets down to it and they have a $500 million pot, well, the attorneys who are working on this are going to end up with probably, oh, I don't know, maybe 50, 60 percent of that pot on top of they'll probably charge the uh, class members all their attorney's fees, which from what I can tell is going to be between at least 30 to 50 million dollars for this long of a time and this much paperwork and sub lawyers and, uh, you know, subcontracted lawyers and paralegals, all kinds of things. That's how this works. They're going to do all that. And then out of that 500 million, there might be 200 million left. And then that's going to get split out and sent out to, I don't know, a hundred thousand, a million people, who knows? And then, so they, you know, it's going to come down to where people are probably going to get like a check for 15 to $25. And um, that hasn't even come to fruition yet. And so the only ones who really make out, like winners here are the law firm, but I do see, you know, I will show you they, see this is, uh, this is an interesting thing about the law. You get involved in a case like this and you literally have to keep it open. And while there's a huge payout at the end of the day, once it's done, um, it can obviously take years and probably sometimes, you know, maybe it never get paid out. Who knows? So, um, you know, that's, but that's what they're looking for is that big payout at the end uh, for years of work. And some of sometimes lawyers can go bankrupt chasing these kind of cases. So anyway, that's just an interesting update. If you want to see the original story, I will put a link to it. Uh, I did have a video. Here's that video. Sony's competitions pays millions for cheating on TVs. So that was the original video again back in May 30th. So if you want to check that out, there's some more information there. But it's just a really interesting uh, kind of advancement in this thing. And again, if you ask me personally what I think, I just think these attorneys are going to continue to duke this out. And uh, they'll eventually, somebody eventually probably will get paid because these are big companies who actually have the money and are still in business and have had to make these settlement payments probably already to this point. It's just this money is either uh, sitting in an escrow or a fund or something waiting to get paid out, I'd imagine. So just an interesting story here, and i definitely working on the D24. I've recapped one of the boards already, and I've got the first video um, actually coming on that really soon. Look for that next week, and uh, then we'll get into just a whole long series on that uh, D24 because I really want to completely uh, go through every board kind of. There are some surface mount capacitors that are definitely bad on some of the boards that's going to need to be replaced. And that's something we've never worked with uh, because they're not really in other PVMs. 
or BVMs very much. I mean, really, other B PVMs and BVMs that are lower end don't have surface mount components, or they have components, but not capacitors. So that should be an interesting thing. And uh, thanks again, everybody, and I'll see you guys next time with some more retro content.